Church. Uh, there's an event that's coming up uh, this summer, August 4th and 5th. We've been a part of this event for as long as it's been around as a church. It's called the Global Leadership Summit. When it first started, uh, it was held uh, in one location, and now it's simulcast not just all over the country, but all over the world. And it's two days of leadership talks that are laser-focused on leadership. And the big idea of these speakers that speak from across different uh, lines of work, study, ministry, corporate, uh, nonprofit, uh, humanitarian, everything you can think of, the idea is if you approach this with humility, there's something you can learn that can help you as a leader wherever you are as a leader. And the thing is, everyone has influence. You are a leader. The question is, are you leading and are you growing as a leader? Some of us lead more than others, but everybody has the opportunity to influence. And that's simply what leadership is, is influence. And so as a church, we commit to sending leaders and going and being there for two days uh, to try and grow as leaders. And so one of the uh, key speakers of the GLS and the point guy for it is Craig Rochelle. And I want him to tell you a little bit about it first. Hi, my name is Craig Rochelle. I'm the pastor of Life Church, and one of the great honors of my life is to serve the Global Leadership Network to help build leaders around the world because God used the Global Leadership Summit to actually change my life and leadership. And I just want to talk to you for a minute and tell you, if you've forgotten that you are a leader, what is leadership? Leadership is influence, and you have influence. You can influence your family, you can influence your friends, you can influence the people in your church and all around you, and your leadership matters so much. And that's why it is so important for you to invest in your leadership, because we never ever get better by accident. I wanna tell you that attending the Global Leadership Summit on August the 4th and the 5th is one of the best ways to grow in your leadership. We'll provide practical, actionable content from leadership experts from around the world that will help sharpen your leadership. And the good news is, this weekend, we have a great opportunity for you. We want everyone in your congregation to be able to come. And so the GLN has reduced the ticket prices to only $139. Your pastor or your host can provide details. But what I promise you is, when you grow in your leadership, you can make a bigger difference in the lives of the people around you. So let's do it. I'll see you there on August the 4th and the 5th. And we know that everyone wins when the leader gets better. So these are some of the speakers that will be here this year. Uh, like I said, they come from a lot of different uh, fields. Uh, they all are talking about leadership, and it's pra practical, actionable leadership content. Uh, you just heard from Craig Groeschel. John Acuff has been a favorite speaker and author for many of you ours. Uh, for years around here. She's the uh, CEO of In-N-Out Burger. That's an amazing company. And if you haven't been in an In-N-Out Burger before, uh, yeah, they're good, right? Like <laughs> West, West Coast coming at you. Uh, but here, here's the deal. Uh, every year I show up to this and I hear who they announce as speakers and I'm like, oh, I'm really going to like this one, or I, I don't care about, I'm not sure I'm going to get much out of this one. I'm always surprised that some of the things I walk away with from people I didn't expect, from people that do something very different than me, that are a very different place in life from me. But every year, I can say consistently with the GLS, I have grown as a leader. And I really do think, I learned this at the GLS a long time ago, and I've committed to it, that there's four ways you grow as a leader. You read or listen to everything you can about leadership, and I try to do that. You, you, you hang around other leaders and ask questions. I try to do that. You go where leadership taught is taught, and that's why I've committed to going to something like this every year, uh, and you actually lead something. And the thing is, there, there's not a single person in the room that couldn't benefit from you getting better as a leader. One, because you attend this church, we're trying to develop more leaders at Live Oak. We need more leaders. As a matter of fact, if you're currently serving or a leader at Live Oak, We'll help send you this if it's first come, first serve. We'll help send you to this because we believe we need leadership here. But wherever you show up on a Monday or throughout the week, they need leadership there. So if you invest in your leadership benefits here and there, it's great. But the thing is, anytime you lead something, you will always grow. You'll always learn something. So it's a day of investing in that. 
The other thing I love about the Global Leadership Summit, let me just tell you how you can kind of get more information about it. And if, if you have any questions, come see me. One of the things I love about the Global Leadership Summit is they do this live event, August 4th and 5th. And then after that, they have people internationally from all over the world. They translate and they select which talks would be best for different countries. And they take it to literally the four corners of the earth in 52 different languages in all these different countries. And the thing that struck me years ago is if the Global Leadership Summit didn't roll into town in Lubbock as a simulcast, or you didn't, you know, something else, there'd be another leadership event. I've never been to one better than the GLS. I've been to some that are close, but every year consistently, this has been the standard for me. The thing is, the rest of the world doesn't have leadership events rolling in. And so we know as a church, when we invest to send our leaders, some of that funding that we use to buy those tickets goes to take the GLS to the four corners of the world. My kids were adopted from the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is, uh, it is a country that has struggled for years. And the GLS shows up in their town, uh, in Kinshasa, the, the capital of the DRC, three times uh, in a year. They show up in, in, in places that are, uh, they can't even announce because they're um, restricted countries and they have to kind of be low key. They, it, it shows up all over the world. And so for us, when we invest in this, to go, we know it, and we're investing in our leadership. We're hopefully investing in your leadership for, at Live Oak if you attend, and we're investing in leaders around the world. And we go with people from around our city. The other thing that we do is there's a number of leaders in our city that are under resourced. They can't afford to go to a conference like this, and so Live Oak and some others uh, invest to send under resourced leaders from our community there. And if you'd like to be part of that, or if you'd like to bring anybody from your workplace, please let me know because I really believe in this event, the ripple it can create for our city, the ripple it creates for our world. But the main ripple that I'm also praying for is that it would do something here that we would develop more leaders because you're leaders. Some of you just don't know it. And some of you aren't investing in it. And so we wanna encourage you to be part of that. Here's the information of how to get it. You can attend in person or online. We're encouraging you to attend in person if you can, because we'd like to attend this together. So there you go. We're spending the summer in the Psalms. Summer in the Psalms. See what you did there? Summer. See what you did there? Um, anyway, the book of Psalms, it's the longest book of the Bible. We won't get all the way through it here. We have it as part of our reading plan this summer, a chapter a day. We won't get through it there. It is 150 chapters written over almost a thousand years by numerous authors. And it's unlike any other book. It's poetry, it's prayer, it's someone's journal, it's a song book, it's a prayer book. It's, it's just this interesting book of the Bible that's unlike any of the others. Uh, David wrote more Psalms than anybody else, almost half of them, but others wrote some, and we don't even know who wrote some of them. And when every time you read the book of Psalms, let me just give you a tip. They have different genres. You know what genres is? A genre would be like, what kind of book are you reading? Uh, fiction. Well, is it, uh, is it a mystery? Is it romance? Is it historical fiction? Like, is it you know, science fiction? Those are genres. Music. I like music. What kind of music? I like the jazz. I like the blues. I like country. You know, like those are different genres. In the Psalms, they have different genres. And, and if you want to know what type of psalm you're reading, read it and try and think about what's the mood of what's going on here. Like, what, what does it feel like the person is feeling? Because there's two big genres and then a lot of other ones. The two big ones is there's praise psalms. They're thankful. They're praising God. Thank you. You're wonderful. And then there's lament psalms. That's kind of the blues. Things are not going well. I'm in a bad place. I'm stuck. Lament and praise. Praise and lament. Those are the two types of psalms. In the middle of that, in the, in breaking those down, there's even other ones. There's some that talk about the coming king, the Messiah. There's some that are called uh, didactic psalms that impart wisdom of how to live. There, there are some that are uh, imprecatory. I always have trouble with that word. But basically it's, I'm gonna punch you in the mouth. God, that's my enemy. I want you to hit him. If you don't, I, I, I will. Like, like there's those types. 
There's some that are more thankful. There's some that are more praise. There's all these different types, but mainly there's these Psalms and praise. And when you read the book of Psalms, there's 150 chapters, but it's not written like the gospel of John or a historical book where it's telling a story over time. They're laid out kind of individually, although and sometimes there are sections, and we're looking at a section this summer called the Songs of Ascents, but they're, la- they're actually laid out very, very intentionally. And if you read the book of Psalms, which what this summer we're asking is spend the summer in the Psalms, dive into this book a little bit each day and see what it might do for your life spiritually. Because as you read them, there's actually within the book of Psalms, every now and then you'll get to a, a Psalm and right above it, it'll say book one. And then about 30, 40 chapters later, book two. It's divided into five books. And the last five chapters all begin and end with the same words. Praise the Lord. It's in the Hebrew, hallelujah, hallelujah, which, hallel, which is praise, and then Yah, which is sort for Yahweh. It's praise God. And, and actually what's interesting is you read the book of Psalms, there are more lament psalms at the beginning, and toward the end there's more praise. But there's a little bit of both in both, both early and late. They're always in there because that's kind of how life is. Some days it's a lot of praise. And some days you look at the world, you look at your life, you look at your neighbor, and there's some lament. And at the very last five, it ends with this place of praise God. And he says at the beginning and the end of the song. And it's almost as if it's saying we're on a journey. And these psalms are songs for the journey. And the very first two psalms are clues into how to read the psalms. The very first psalm says this. Blessed is the one... Is, are you someone who wants to be blessed? He's saying, here's who's the one that blessed is, who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of the sinners, stand, uh, 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 sinners take or, or sit in the company of mockers. That person's not blessed. The one who is, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and here's the key word, meditates on his law day or night. The very first Psalm says, if you want to understand the key, not just to understanding the book of Psalms, but to understanding how you go through this journey of life, make sure you pay attention to who you're walking with. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Be careful about who is influencing you and make sure your primary influence is God's truth, that you meditate, you think deeply on it. So the very first Psalm says, hey, read this and think deeply on it. And be careful about who's in your ear along the way trying to tell you something else. That's what it says is the very key to this psalm of what it looks like to get the most out of it. And as you read the book of Psalms, as you go through it, sometimes you'll read these psalms and they're crying out for help. Or they're saying, God, you help me. Or God, you're wonderful. Or I'm, you know, Psalm 19, we read it Friday. It's your creation is wonderful. And as you read those what you find is you're not alone. That others feel the same way you do because you're gonna have days where you feel like I wanna punch my neighbor in the mouth. And you read the Psalms and go, oh, he did too. And then you'll find that there are days where he said, I was in trouble and I called out to God and he came to my rescue. And hopefully you can have experienced that too. And if not, you learn that it's possible. When you read the book of Psalms, you learn you're not alone. You also learn you're not alone because the recurring theme of the Psalms is he's with me. He hears me. He's for me. He will fight for me. He will provide for me. He's there. And so these songs of ascents that we're reading is Psalm 120 through 134, 15 Psalms. And they were a playlist. Or if you're older and you're a child of the 80s or before, a mixtape. They were a set of songs that they sang when they were going on a road trip. A road trip that they would take maybe three times a year going to Jerusalem. And as they would go on this road trip, they would sing these songs they would sing them together. It's called the Song of Ascents because Jerusalem was the highest point of, of land in, in Israel. So no matter where you were coming from, it was an uphill journey. You were ascending. Some people call it the Song of Degrees, like you're going up a little bit of time, a little bit of time. Some people believe that they actually 
instead, or also sang these as they walked up the steps of the temple, as they would ascend to this temple that was in Jerusalem where they would go for worship and certain festivals or, or events several times a year. And as they would go up, they would sing these songs and you, as, 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 psalms. And as you read them, you realize th there's some meaning behind all of them that kind of give I ideas to their journey. Here's the thing. We're not taking a road trip to Jerusalem. <laughs> the temple's not there. We're not doing that. So these still have value on it for us because we are disciples who are on, who are on a journey as well. We are on a journey through life. Every day is another step along the 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 time between the dashes, the dash between the two dates and when you're born and you die, you're on a journey as well. And as you go on that journey, this can be the songbook, the playlist, the mixtape, and the prayer book for you on your journey. Uh, one of the books that me and some of the other people that are teaching this summer as we teach through this, uh, one of the books we read is by Eugene Peterson called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And he's quoting Frederick Nietzsche who says, that's what life demands, a long obedience in the same direction. And basically, Eugene Peterson says, using these as his uh, guide, that we're on a journey in this world, every single one of us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're on a journey as a disciple. Following Jesus implies movement. You're going somewhere. A disciple means you're a learner of Jesus who's becoming like Jesus. And only you can probably know how much progress you're making on that journey. But every day, we're trying to follow Jesus to learn from him as he helps us become like him, as he shapes our character and transforms us spiritually. The other word that Eugene Peterson uses were disciples, but we're also pilgrims, just like they were. And when you hear, and I hear the word pilgrim, we picture Thanksgiving, or you might be thinking about turkey right now, like, ooh, turkey sounds good for lunch, or, you know, something like that. Those were a type of pilgrims, but pilgrims are people who are going somewhere. They're not where they're supposed to be. They're moving somewhere. And a, a, a pilgrim is very different than a tourist. Actually, Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus said, he said, dear friends, I urge you. And here's how he called us, foreigners and exiles. This is how people who followed Jesus for 2,000 years, and before that, we're looking forward to Messiah for thousands of years, they viewed themselves as foreigners and exiles. This world is not my home. I am not a resident. I'm a pilgrim. God is taking me somewhere. And one of the places he's taking us is eventually he will bring us home to him. But it's not just that. It's not just a, 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 a destination eternally. It's a destination spiritually of we are, tr we are journal journeying to become more like him. We're disciples and we're pilgrims. But too often we think of ourselves as residents or tourists. A tourist is very different than a disciple. A, disi a tourist, I'm here to enjoy it. I'm just here to get something out of this and then get a postcard and buy a t-shirt to take home to a friend. And I just want to get all of this world out of, out of this world all I can and, and then I'll move on. You're a pilgrim. God wants you to take you somewhere. He wants to lead you somewhere. And the journey is not easy because I drift from being a disciple and a pilgrim to being a tourist and a resident very, very easily. I want to be comfortable. I want to make myself at home. And so one of the key things that this psalm that we're reading today does is it gets us moving. Psalm 120 is not a happy song. They didn't start off the playlist with one of those up-tempo, like, I don't know what your song is. I'd love to know what your song is. If you're making a playlist, what's the first song you're playing as you leave town? Uh, one of the songs that I love that's a high-energy, upbeat song uh, there's a song called Radar Love. It's an older song. And this is a true story. Like it was on my playlist for a road trip because back a long time ago, I was driving from San Diego, California all the way up and I went San Diego to Ontario, California to Bakersfield to Fresno, Stockton. I was going all the way up. In my mind before I took that trip, I thought this will be great California road trip. But those who are West Coasters know that the path I just described was the middle. I was driving through the Lubbock of California, the West Texas of California. 
And so as I was driving, much like West Texas, there was a lot of open space. And here's the thing you need to know about a playlist. Sometimes the song you choose gets you moving too fast. <laughs> Some songs make you want to push down on the accelerator a little bit. Radar Love is a song that does that. So I'm driving between L.A. and Bakersfield in the middle of nowhere, all alone, I thought, and I'm driving pretty fast, and that song is, is playing, and I'm singing, and all of a sudden, I look in my rearview mirror, and there was a member of our law enforcement community coming to say, say welcome to California. What was really cool as a child, as I grew up watching the show Chips, it was the California Highway Patrol, and I was like, John and Potter are behind me, but they're in a car. It must be Sergeant Baker or whatever, or Sergeant whoever it is. And so I pull over, and I was excited to meet someone from the show Chips, you know, whatever. And, and I pull over, and he goes, do you know how fast you're going? I was like, no, but it had to be a lot, because I wasn't paying attention. I apologize. And he goes, you're going, and I'm not going to say what it was. It was really, really high. <laughs> I, well, just for the sake of time, to speed the story up. And uh, he said, why are you in such a hurry? And I said, well, I, I guess I was listening to this song and it got me moving. And he goes, what was the song? I said, Radar Love. He goes, all right, just watch your speed. <laughs> Maybe play a different song for a while. And he sent me away. It was great. I, I appreciate John and Ponch so much doing that for me. But uh, the thing is, songs impact us. We feel something from it. And the songs of a sense are like that. So as, you, as I'm going to read the psalm all the way through, and then I'm going to go back and read it. As I read that, tell me if, you, if this feels, what kind of genre it feels like. Tell me what you think. Um, tell me what you think the mood is of this psalm. I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. What will he do to you and what more besides, you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with the warrior sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom bush. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshach, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. That's the first song on the playlist. What's the mood? Bad, angry. This would be, definitely be a lament psalm and maybe one of those I want to punch you in the mouth songs. Why in the world would this be their first song on their playlist? Why would they just sing the song as they're setting out to go worship? Because here's the thing about any time you need to get people moving, like you can't, you have to, have to want to go somewhere. And sometimes to want to go there, I've got to realize I'm not content here. I've got to get, this is a get you moving. And God, we need your help on the journey. Not just the journey from here to Jerusalem, but the journey through life. God, we need your help. And here's what he says, very, very, first one. I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. He actually says, I've been in places of distress before. And he does this. He answers me. He responds when I call to him. This is a belief he has that's based on experience. Eventually, when you look to the Lord, you'll have experience too. And that's so important because that's what you reflect on when the world is going bad and the world's falling apart or you even drive yourself in the ditch. You need to understand, hey, my belief from my experience is that when I call on the Lord in my distress, he answers me. It's remembering with thankfulness God's past faithfulness. So it starts off thankful. But then in verse two, it's a new plea for help. This is more present tense. Save me, Lord. From what? From lying lips and from deceitful tongues. There may be one or two of you in the world that feel like our world is full of a lot of shady truth and people that want to manipulate or have an agenda or hateful speech, uh, slandering mouths. Like, I, I'm sure there's only one or two of you feel that way because, I mean, the world's pretty, pretty truthful and calm these days, isn't it? I mean, it's almost as if this guy could have been talking about where we are now. God, I feel like people are not being truthful with me. Or they're deceitful, or they're speaking harm to me. 
This is a new plea, plea for help. And this is a repeated theme throughout the Psalms. This is why so many times we read it, we realize, hey, I'm not alone. Others feel this way too. It's a desire for divine protection in a hostile world. It's acknowledging God, there is a God and it's not me and I need his help. And it's a plea for help. So here's the question. Is this a lament psalm? I said there's two types, lament or praise. Is this a lament or a praise song? Who thinks it's lament? Who thinks it's praise? Who thinks it's both? Yeah, it's both. Everyone's right. Even the ones who just stood at me like this the whole time and never, <laughs> I can see you. This is not, you're in person. This is a live audience. I can see you. <laughs> like it's both. That's one of the things is when you read a psalm, sometimes, the, and you can look it up, there's all kinds of charts of people trying to chart out what type of psalm this is. One of the charts I read had three different ones on this one. It was Thanksgiving, it was Lament, and it was called a Pilgrim Psalm or a Zion, like Journey to Jerusalem, a Pilgrim Psalm. It's, it's, it's all three of these. Because that's how our prayers are, Right? I don't just sit down and say, today, I'm just going to do a Thanksgiving prayer. It's not a bad idea. Or today, I'm just going to do, I'm angry at my neighbor. And God, if you don't help me, I'm going to punch him in the mouth psalm <laughs> prayer. I'm going to pray that today. No, we, we, our prayers are like that. So that's how a lot of the psalms are. But usually they have an overriding theme. More verses in this one have to do with, I don't like how my neighbor speaks uh, untruthfully and is violent than it does to God and his faithfulness but he's still starting his psalm focused on who God is. This is a, a lament psalm and a thanksgiving psalm. Because here's the thing, and you see, this isn't just unique to the book of Psalms. You, you can read the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus. We live in a world of already, like God is my leader, but also a world of not yet. We live in a world where thy kingdom come but things still aren't right. God hasn't just said, time's up. I'm shutting everything down and I'm gonna restore things, you know, the factory settings uh, back to the way I want it to be because he wants to give people time to respond. He's waiting on his disciples to go make more disciples. We live in a world where the kingdom of God is at hand, but we don't experience it fully. It's all ready, but not yet. And that's what the psalmist talks about. God saves me in my distress, but even when he does that, I'm still in distress. And the tenses of, of this psalm, verse, in verse one, it's already done and, and currently happening. But if you look at verses two and, and the rest of the verses we read, read um, it's not yet. Because here's what he says next. Here's the not yet kind of, all of a sudden he shifts from what God has done and what he wants God to do. He starts talking to his neighbor to the person in the world that's causing him trouble. What will he do to you? And what more besides you, what more besides you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with the warrior sharp arrows with burning coals of the broom bush. Like you come across a phrase you don't understand. I can kind of figure out what he means here. Burning coals of a broom bush. Basically that's where they got firewood. And I love firewood. I've got a fireplace on my patio. I love fire. And there's different types of wood. Like, like some are soft woods. They burn quickly. Some are hard woods and they burn long and they're also very hard. They burn hot. Um, this was a burn a long time and burns very hot. Let's make an error out of it and shoot my neighbor's lying mouth. Yeah, he's got, it's an angry psalm. He's an angry elf. Like this is, man, he's got some stuff going on here. But what's, what do you do when you have something and you feel that to your neighbor? Talk to God about it. Don't talk to your neighbor about it. I'm gonna give them a piece of my social media mind. I'm gonna text them and tell them what I think. I'm gonna tell them what I think about them. No, take it to the Lord. He's the one that needs to hear that. And basically he's asking a rhetorical question here to his enemy as he's praying to God. He's having that imaginary fight you have in the car with the person who just made you mad at that meeting. You're driving away going, I would have said this and they would have said that and here's what I'll say to them. He's having that, but he's having it with the Lord. But he's really wanting unhappy things to happen to his neighbor. Then he kind of turns to self-pity. 
Woe to me that I dwell on Meshach and that I live among the tents of Kedar. Now, I could have figured out the whole coals from a broom bush thing. This, what do you do when you come across this and you're reading something in the Bible? Well, this is just a great study tip is this is why having a study Bible is so helpful. Because a lot of times you look down and I'll have a little note and say, this is what Meshach and Kadar are. And basically, it's lost on us now without some context. So I, rec- I used the Life Application Study Bible, and it had a note in here that helped me understand what this is. What he's not saying is, I dwell among those in Muleshoe Mule and Tahoka. It's not saying that. This isn't about geography. It's about the state of the world. One of these is a nation far away, about as far north as they would really know of near where modern-day Russia is, far north in very violent people. These were like the Klingons of their, like the, the, the bad guys, the stormtroopers, the, the bad guys that were very deceitful, swindlers, and violent. And then the tents of Kadar was a roaming tribe that had no home and would often move into yours and cause trouble. Basically, he says, I'm living in a place where I don't want to be with people I don't want to be around who are doing things I don't want to experience you're going to feel like that at some point in life. You're going to feel like you're out of place. You're going to feel like, I really don't like what's happening over here. I don't like what's happening to me. He says, that's where I feel like I dwell. I'm living where I don't want to be around stuff I don't want to see. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace. Peace. But when I speak, they're for war. Then he ends his psalm. He just drops the pen or the quill or the, I mean, he wasn't typing it, obviously. He didn't drop his iPad. He just stops writing. That's it. He just leaves it in God's hands. But this is the song they sang. Why? Because they recognized, this world's not my home. I've got to get moving. It's a lament concerning the situation. It admits, I'm not home, so I've got to keep moving forward. C.S. Lewis said, if I find myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. That's kind of what he's saying. I'm not at home in this world. And I think God would say, good, let's get moving. So when I read this, Psalm 120, and I did in our journals, Scripture, Observation, Application, I walked away with three possible applications. It's a choose your own adventure. It's a choose your own ending. You can figure out which one applies to you most. You know, this was my key verse. I wanted to memorize that. I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. That's easy to memorize. And I have a feeling I'm gonna need to know that from time to time. I'm gonna find myself in distress. So the big takeaway for me was when I'm in distress, I need to call on the Lord. I need to call on him always. But when I'm in distress, before I do anything else, I need to call on the Lord. My first call, my first choice, my first option to look to him. Because when I'm in distress, I tend to do bad things. I get emotional, I respond, I act out, I look to hide, whatever it is. There's different things we respond when we're in distress. God says, if you're in distress, come to me right away. Don't let me be your second call, let me be your first choice. So maybe that's where you are. Maybe you feel like you're in a place of distress. What does it look like for you to call on the Lord, to look to him? That was one of the things I walked away with. Here's the lesson that he teaches us though. When I do that, I'll have a story to tell too. Just like he does. See, he said, but from experience, he answers me. It's what he does. The more you do this, the more you're likely to turn to him right away or turn to him when things are fine any, all, on a normal day. When you learn this from experience, you trust it more. Following Jesus requires some blind faith up front. I don't know how this is going to work out. I'll take a step. God, I'm giving you everything. I trust you. My life is yours. I'm taking a step. I don't know how this is going to turn out. But over time, you start seeing how it turns out. He provided then. He came through then. He forgave me then. So suddenly you have a story to tell too. 
that you can draw from and so can others. Some of the best things you can do for the people you want to influence is tell them, hey, you know what? I'm in distress, but I'm calling on the Lord. This is how he answered me. Every one of you has a story to tell. When's the last time you told your story to somebody? But first, you live out your story. And the thing I love, the God who answered him is the same God who answers you. You don't get like tech support for God or you don't go to a call center. You don't get a, an intern or, the, or the ju, you know, a junior version of God. It's the same God answers you that answered him. That's one of the great things we see in Psalms is his distress of how God answered him. I can learn from that too and realize it's the same God. Here's the third lesson. This was my big takeaway. I need to live in this world as a disciple and pilgrim, not a tourist or resident. Because I tend to live sometimes life as a tourist. I just want to get as much out of this as I can. Or a resident, I just want to make myself at home here. And this psalmist and the, all those who sang this for th several thousand years, who sang these songs as they were going to worship, they needed something to get them going, a reminder that this world is not my home. I need what only God can do for me. And I need to get moving. This world is not my home and I need to get moving on the journey following Jesus as, a, as a disciple and a pilgrim who's going somewhere. Would you describe your spiritual life these days that as you being on a journey and you feel like you're going somewhere, like you're moving, like God's moving you on the journey? Because a lot of times, most of us would be honest and say, I feel stuck. When you look at the world, it can make you feel stuck or get st stuck in despair. But instead, God says, no, it's not supposed to be like this. Let's get moving. Let me take you somewhere. And before I bring you home, I have something for you here. When I read Psalm 120 the first time, I was like, I don't get it. But the more I spent time with it, the more I got something out of it. And that's why I want you to spend the summer in the Psalms too. So we have a reading plan that you can access easily from the app, website, or digital bulletin under Sunday Resources. And this week, you have a reading plan. of On the Sunday, you're reading the psalm we're studying in here. So if you want to read it before you come, that would be great. I encourage you to do it for next week at Psalm 121. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to look at Psalm 1, that very first psalm uh, that we, I, I mentioned earlier. And just read and reflect on that and see what God has for you. Then on Tuesday, you're reading Psalm 21, then Psalm 22. Uh, Psalm 24, because we already did Psalm 23 last Sunday. And then on Friday, Psalm 25, which, uh, guys, if you want to come on Friday mornings to Rudy's, 7.30 to 8 a.m., uh, we, we take a psalm this summer and we're reading and reflecting on it together. The same what's in the reading plan. The reason we want you to spend the summer in the psalms is we think God has something for you there. Something for your journey that will get you moving. And, and for those that are in a time of distress, I, I don't want you to experience information. I want you to experience the God of transformation who promised to show up and be with you as you go on this journey. So join us this summer as we're in the summer of the Psalms. Um, if you need a, 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 a journal, we have some at Guest Central. Uh, and I would love to hear any feedback you have. The next uh, several weeks, you're going to hear from several people other than me. I'll be here uh, as we look at different Psalms. And, and you're going to hear several different voices, which I'm excited about. Um, these are not people that are teaching because I'm out of town. These are people that are teaching because I think they have something to say. And again, a part of our role is to develop leaders and teachers here. And so I'm excited for that, that we have some people that are, uh, have something to say. But at the same time, you have something as well that God has for you as you engage with him in the scriptures that you can find. So I encourage you to spend the summer in the Psalms with us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thanks that you love us. Thanks that you're taking us somewhere. Sometimes we get bogged down. I get stuck and I'm trying to, to be a resident or, or be a tourist. And you want me to be a disciple who's learning from you and becoming more like you. Thanks that I can do that as I read the Psalms. Jesus, you, you quoted the Psalms so many times. Help me to draw from you what you want me to see as I engage the book of Psalms. And God, for those of us who are in distress, help us to call from you, to call on you, to look to you, to lead us. And God, I pray that we would hear your voice and we would have a story to tell, and we would tell our story of this great God that we serve. So in Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Thanks for being here. Have a great week.